Most musicians are used to being in, a, in an environment that is competitive, where they need to protect themselves. They need to hide what's really going on, whether that's an injury or a fear or whatever it is, and basically have this armor up. And that is exhausting. Hey everybody, this is Chris from HonestyPill.com. You're listening to episode 14 of the Honesty Pill podcast. This season on the show, I'll be talking to innovative musician entrepreneurs who have created new ways of performing, new ways of teaching, and new ways of serving their audiences. My guest today is business coach Jennifer Rosenfeld, and if you're a fan of this podcast, you've probably already heard her name and know who she is. Jennifer works with top musicians to create profitable and impactful online education businesses that enable her clients to win back their time and pursue their dream creative projects. So did you catch that, musicians? Win back your time and pursue your dream projects. Sounds amazing. If you are a musician who feels out of control right now, feels depleted, or feels overworked and underpaid, then this episode is for you. There is literally no one else I can think of who is having as much impact on the music industry, helping musician entrepreneurs completely transform their lives as Jennifer. A leading arts entrepreneurship educator and speaker, Jennifer has worked with nonprofits, university music programs and conservatories, and professional musicians on developing a wide range of educational and artistic projects. So many of the people in my own circles have worked with her, including me, and the ripple effect of her impact is kind of mind-blowing. We're going to talk about her favorite TV show, favorite type of cheese, and maybe even a little bit of business development talk. Get out a pen and paper because you're going to want to take notes on this one. Let's dig into my conversation with Jennifer Rosenfeld. Okay, everybody, as we get close to wrapping up season one of the Honesty Pill podcast, I cannot think of a better way to celebrate this milestone than to have as my guest, my personal coach and business mentor, co-founder of Iconenza Artist, co-author of Awakening Your Business Brain, and the person responsible for everything you will find at jenniferrosenfeld.com. And I guess I just gave away the name. I'm so beyond thrilled to have you here on the podcast. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you so much. It's an honor for me to be here. So I think the running theme of this interview is going to be centered around musicians who are highly skilled coming to the realization that they can not only be artistically satisfied, able to pursue creative projects, but they can actually be financially stable on their own terms. Would you say that's your mission? What have I left out? No, that's really it. You know, I think it's such a misconception that musicians or artists or creatives are only good at their art and incapable when it comes to other things. And yet that is a message that is often sent in very explicit and implicit ways to this community. And I see it as, first of all, totally capable of becoming empowered when it comes to those things. But I also see it as a liability for the entire world if the creative population is not able to have autonomy and freedom in their creative work. You know, when so many artists or creators are devoting all of that energy to other people's projects or to the service of someone else's vision, which is a beautiful thing, there's still a lot of great creative work that's not getting done because they don't have the time, the energy, or the resources to do it. So that's, you know, I love helping musicians make money, but that's sort of my why behind it is what does that open up as far as the creative potential that exists for, for all these people? It's, it's understandable that we're brought up this way though, right? Because we are brought up with the idea of the starving artist or it's romantic to starve for your art. And it's always been my position that it's easier to be creative when there's food in the pantry and money in the bank. And that's something that you've seemed to lead with, with every conversation you've had with me, certainly with the conversations and social media and all the things that you're doing, reaching out beyond the circle of the people you're working with. Absolutely. There's just such a perpetuation still of this idea that it is noble to make sure everyone knows how not for the money you are doing this, you know, and there's just we need to let that go as a badge of honor. It's not useful. And like you said, I think creativity happens when we feel safe and secure and not when we feel, you know, at the edge of our basic needs being uncovered. I love the idea of redefining our relationship with two things that musicians have a terrible relationship with time and money. It's it's I'm always overworked and underpaid. I'm tired and I don't have enough of what I need. And wouldn't it be great if 
all of us and our like-minded friends had so much money that we could just impact whatever change we wanted. That would be amazing. How do you bridge from this creative part to the business world, though? And I'm going to lead this off with a true or false question for you. Okay, here we go. Are you ready for this question? True or mm -hmm. false? In order to be successful in business, and I mean really successful, you need a JD, MBA, dual degree from Stanford. Oh, for sure you don't. For sure you don't. <laughs> Do you have any personal uh, feelings about that? Yeah, totally. I mean, um, I'm very grateful for the education that I've received. It was an incredible opportunity. I honestly really thought I needed it. Um, and I, I ended up not deciding to not be a lawyer. So you figured out very quickly that that path was not for me, even though for many years I really thought that was the path. And I got a business degree because I was starting to be curious about this business thing after I'd co-founded iCadenza and knew nothing about it. I was a Russian literature major in college. Talk about, you know, great career paths, um, which, you know, by the way, that's I think majoring in Russian literature is still one of the best decisions I've ever made. I have no regrets about that. Brilliant. But um, I, I felt really frustrated when I left graduate school because I felt still as incompetent when it came to running my business as I did before. And I actually felt worse because I had a degree on top of it. So you definitely do not need that um, for the type of entrepreneurial path that I have walked down and that I lead people down, I really think that an MBA is just not the right education for what we need. It's, it's valuable, but it's just not the most relevant thing for what, for the type of business that I run and that I help my clients run. Do you think most musicians have an entrepreneurial spirit at some point in their careers? I think so. You know, I think, the, the type of musician who is successful in what we do here, I believe is someone who has a really healthy balance of sort of right brain, left brain. They can be big and creative, but they can also be systematic. But the truth is, I believe you need those two things to succeed as a musician, just artistically anyways, certainly in classical music, but really in any field. It's really this balance between this great creative spark and being able to turn it into small steps. So just the choice to know I want to devote my life and my career to being the arts is a sign to me of a person who says, I have something in me that I want to express that needs to come out and my life will be incomplete if that's not a part of what I do. And in essence, I think that is an entrepreneurial spirit in there that is looking to find its place and Maybe that's also a person who's very happy being an employee or, you know, just playing the music that's handed to them all the time. But um, oftentimes I've seen it be so satisfying for musicians to also create that same kind of creativity and freedom in their business life, too. And that taking a risk like that also is very inherent. If you're an entrepreneur or a musician or any creative, you're going to run up against no. You're going to hear no. You're going to fail. You're going to have some twists and turns. And this next line of questioning is going to make sense in a minute. Can we talk about the TV show Crazy Ex-Girlfriend for a minute? Yes. And for those, of you, for, for those of you not familiar with the show, there's a character who thinks he wants to go to law school. And there's a whole montage scene where lawyers are passionately trying to talk him out of it. Just to set the context, I want to quickly share with you the lyrics for some of our listeners, if you don't know it. So here's here's the lyrics from Don't Be a Lawyer. Sure, your parents might... By the way, I'm not going to sing this. Sure, your parents might think you're a failure, but no one's ever said, first, let's kill all the tailors. Don't be a lawyer. The job's inherently crappy. That's why you've never met a lawyer who's happy. It's a guaranteed soul destroyer. Don't be a lawyer. Wow. <laughs> so... You see the reason why I bring this up. And thanks for waiting. Finally, here's the setup question. Is there a moment in your life where you experienced what could quite legitimately be considered a failure that ended up redirecting your entire life's mission in a way that you could never have planned? Yeah, t totally. Um, this song hit home for me in a really big way. I know some lawyers who are very happy. I know Many of the people I went to law school with who are no longer lawyers or who are trying to get out. Um, but, 
you know, I wanted to be a lawyer because I thought that was a way that I could make a difference and help the world. And it was not, um, it became clear very early on that this was not the path for me. But, you know, like most achievement driven people, I still wanted to prove to myself that I could succeed at it. And to become a lawyer, to get into law school, you have to take standardized tests. And to become a lawyer, you have to pass the bar exam. And I actually failed the California bar exam, not just once, but twice. I love it. <laughs> yeah, the first, time, the first time I had a computer malfunction, which was really horrible, and I had to switch from typing to writing by hand, I still probably would have failed if it weren't for that. And the second time I studied really hard and they only give you your score if you don't pass. And I was literally five points away from passing. And it was devastating because you can't just, it takes five months to get your score and then you have to wait another however many months to take it again. So by that time, all the information was gone. You know, the reason I bring it up, I mean, it's a funny song and it's silly, but the fact that people are expected to, in a very stereotypically cliched way, become a doctor or become a lawyer, it's really a, a point that's worth focusing on because we are expected to do certain things and there are certain social norms that say these are successful careers and these are not. And I think that's where the problems start for musicians is I can't think of too many musicians who when they told mom and dad, I want to major in band when I go to college, that they got a good reaction. Most of us were told, that's not a real job. You're going to starve. And that doesn't have to be that way. And I think that for the first time in my life, I've been doing this for a long time, playing the trumpet. For the first time in my life, I am seeing with such clarity that there are other options for people and options that can make real money and make real difference for people. It's not just about scraping by or having enough. It's about having the empowerment to do whatever you want. Yeah, totally. Can I share one anecdote with you, Chris? Of course. Um, I don't think I've really told anyone this. Um, I was very embarrassed and ashamed for a long time about my failing the bar exams. And, you know, especially I have an academic background. I went to Stanford and there's not a lot of people who go to Stanford Law School and don't pass the bar exam, you know? So it felt really embarrassing. And also it meant either that I, either that I'm not smart or worse that I wasn't hardworking enough. And so there was, you know, a lot of that going on. Um, I had been given an offer to join a, a, a law firm after my summer. So I, I you know, I had, I turned it down. This was many years ago, but in April of this year, I remember I had my biggest month financially in business ever, you know, in the midst of the pandemic. And um, the money that I made that year was more than the first year salary that I was offered at a major law firm years before. And it was really finally that moment. Not that everything's about money. It's really not. But that just felt like this clear moment of I'm so glad I didn't go down that other path. I'm so glad that door slammed shut in my face. Um, this is where I'm meant to be. And um, yeah, it was it was really just this spring that I had that realization and felt the closure around that path and feel so grateful that it didn't work out. Oh, thank you for sharing that. That quote, you're always one decision away from a totally different life rings so true because had you decided to, I don't know, take the bar again or become a paralegal or do any other things that might have been related to what that expectation that was set by you, yourself and the your colleagues, your parents, who knows what, you may have been in a very different situation than you are right now. And all the ripple effect of the people you have worked with would also be in a different situation, myself included. Uh, I want to circle back because I don't want to let this go without highlighting it in case anyone didn't hear you. You had the best financial year of your business during the pandemic. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah. You know, I've been an entrepreneur for a long time. This is sort of my second rodeo. Um, I co-founded a company, iCadenza, in 2009 and ran that as the CEO for about 10 years. And at its height, I think we were doing about half a million dollars a year. And, and by the way, I guess to interrupt myself, I like to talk about money and real numbers and I invite my clients to do the same just because it's such a taboo subject. I gained so much from being around entrepreneurs who are willing to just say, this is how much I made, this is how much I did in my launch, this is how much I spent on this or that. So that's why I share numbers. Um, I think there still can be kind of a stigma around it or 
or this notion that it's it's crass and means that we are money obsessed, but that's why I share it. So I'm willing to be transparent about my numbers and I just wanna explain why. So anyways, I started my own coaching practice in 2019, really focused on the work that I'm doing now, helping musicians take their knowledge, their expertise as educators primarily or coaches and turn that into a highly profitable business you know, I, I, don't, I don't require it to be online, but for pra- practicality reasons, that's just where it has been. And that was the work that I was doing already for a year or so before the pandemic hit. So this year has just been a really strange one in that I, I was very freaked out on every level, just like everyone else. But I realized pretty quickly that I've sort of been training for this. And everything that I have been doing, teaching, putting in place, this is the moment where it's not just that fun side hustle. It is a livelihood that is so needed. And um, I remember back in March, um, you know, when it became clear that all things were shutting down, all of my clients were getting a lot of work canceled. You know, for me, I, I didn't expect you know, I didn't have work that was canceled, but I, there was a part of me that seriously thought all of my clients are going to ask for their money back because they're going to need it to like pay their rent or to feed their children. So I remember in that moment in March feeling very scared, but thinking all I, the, all that's in my control is to make myself as essential and as indispensable to all my clients. And I went to this place of, okay, what does that mean? What can I do? to make the work that we are doing a part of their lives that they will like fight tooth and nail to keep. So that was really my driving purpose this whole year. It wasn't, I, I downgraded my financial goals, you know, in March, cause I didn't, you know, no, I didn't know what was gonna happen. I just really was focused on the work we're doing has incredible significance. And I would, I will say though that one of the gifts of that is I have been used to feeling like the work that I'm doing with my clients is, is like their neglected stepchild, you know, where they have their real job. And then like, this is kind of like their fun side thing. That's not so important. So I really got to feel the joy of our work becoming the central priority in the professional lives of many of my clients, which is extremely satisfying. I feel like we got to do things this year that wouldn't have been possible if schedules were what they were. So this is a very roundabout answer, but, um, but anyways, yeah, it's been an extraordinary year for me. Um, We're speaking now in December. And I think at this point um, I, I have booked almost $800,000 in my business, which is absolutely insane to me. I did not think it was going to happen. I did not expect it to be in a pandemic year. And so, you know, I I would say all that I have going is I've been able to synergize some ideas from disparate areas and keep putting one foot in front of another and be willing to take risks, be willing to embarrass myself, be willing to get rejected. That's all that I've been doing. So sometimes that little push that's needed for somebody to take their side hustle and become the actual hustle, you know, is needing to pay the rent or feed the kids or whatever. But by the way, fun fact, children are very resilient. They can find food just about anywhere. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, Another reason why being really upfront with numbers, especially for musicians, and I'm going to throw this out there as sort of a counterpoint to what you just said is, and I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. The money that you make at the pinnacle of this industry, and I'm not talking about if you're Yo-Yo Ma or, or some you know, international soloist. I'm talking about the majority of people who are lucky enough to get orchestra jobs or really great college teaching positions. That money that you're making is actually not very much money. Sorry to burst that bubble. And the, the first time I realized this was talking to a lot of my uh, family that is not musicians. They're all in you know other industries that are very lucrative. They're very successful in these industries. They are thought leaders in these other industries. When they found out, you know, I'm in the LA Phil, I'm I'm at the top of my game. I'm in one of the best orchestras in the world, highest paid orchestra in the country. And when they found out what my salary was, they almost laughed right in my face. Like they couldn't believe that that's 
how little technically I was being paid. And that was a wake up call for me too, that, wait a minute, maybe I am playing a really small game and there's a lot more out there. So you just got done, speaking of playing larger games, you just got done running an epic, epic three-day live intensive. And I'm going to tell the, our listeners the name of it in case they don't know, because it also ties into this idea of embracing money and talking about money as energy and energy, energy as currency. And the name of your intensive was the Six Figure Musician Entrepreneur. And I love it that those words live in the same phrase because most people do not put those four words together. Um, for those of you who can't even imagine what this looks like, can you talk a little bit about the impact that you wanted to have by putting this together and what was the biggest takeaway from that event for you? It was a really extraordinary experience. Like you said, we had about a hundred musicians there from all over the world. And, you know, I've been working in this space, the music entrepreneurship, music coaching space for a pretty long time, you know, for over 10 years, a lot has happened in the space. And when I was first starting my career and trying to advance these ideas around how musicians should be proactive. They should take the reins of their careers into their own hands. They should not wait for the call, but take initiative. Those were not ideas that people wanted to hear. You know, in classical music, there's still so much reverence for the traditional path, and I have nothing against it, nothing at all. I'm, I'm just interested in each individual getting to optimize for their happiness and fulfillment. So. If that's the traditional path for you, great. For a lot of people this year, the traditional path sort of revealed it's, uh, um, you know, like a Wizard of Oz thing where the reality did not match the, the vision we had for it. So I've just seen such an incredible collective mindset shift this year of musicians not, I mean, yes, being devastated and let down and feeling like everything I've worked towards is perhaps not leading where I hoped, but also so many musicians recognizing I've had these dreams and desires within me for a long time and I haven't had the space or the bandwidth or the courage to express them. And for me to be in a room with a hundred musicians who are all on the same page about that was so insane. It really is. Not that that's the biggest number of all time, but I have felt like, you know, pretty much not a lot of people are interested in going in this direction. And it just felt like a, a pretty big uh, tidal wave of where the collective mindset is in our industry and the openness to trying new things. And, you know, a big part of when you ask about sort of the big takeaways. Here's what I'll say as far as that event and also as far as my work in general. The impression I get talking to so many musicians is that they are not used to being in a community where they can be themselves, where they can be open, where they feel genuinely supported and encouraged and rooted for by their peers. Most musicians are used to being in, a, in an environment that is competitive, where they need to protect themselves, they need to hide what's really going on, whether that's an injury or a fear or whatever it is, and basically have this armor up. And that is exhausting. The fact that a hundred of us gathered and it's a space where sometimes people cry, sometimes, you know, there's laughing, there's crying, there's vulnerability, there's honesty, and there's this feeling of, wow, maybe I'm not alone. Maybe there are people like me, people who would be happy to see me succeed and not secretly trying to take me down. So that's available. And I think it really requires each of us to play a role in creating that environment. But that's the kind of industry and kind of field, kind of community that I want to be a part of and that I want to encourage other people to be a part of. So that was my biggest takeaway from it. Well, I laughed. I cried. It was better than cats. That's my review. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to circle back to musicals in a minute. So look, I just want to say you orchestrated this event. And it wasn't just like you threw up a Facebook post that said, hey, everybody, why don't you join me for these three days and block out your entire day and, you know, pay some money and we'll do these things. You you created this incredible, really well constructed runway to build up to this event so that when the people who were involved in it showed up, they were already completely conditioned to understand, first of all, what was going to happen and sort of the belief system sort of of what what they needed to 
understand in order to make this work and to embrace the value that they were about to be exposed to. And if there is one word that I had to pick to describe your sales process, in fact, all of your processes, it would be ease. And I have to say, and I have to ask this on behalf of my, my other coaching colleagues, what is the secret? How it, You're kind of like one of those martial artists who's only four foot two, and you're able to just throw you know, hordes of giants off with the slightest energy expelled. I don't understand how you do that. And that's certainly a, a point that I, I wish to master myself. But how do, you, how do you do this with such ease and such effortlessness, yet create these mountainous changes in people's lives? Well, it might look like ease from the outside. I, I can't say that it's always ease on the inside. But what I would say is I have, I'm very grateful to have found a level of alignment in my work now that makes everything so much easier. And I can contrast that from a lot of experiences I've had in my life or career, such as being in law school, which felt like an uphill slog the entire time. Or even in part of my, a large part of my experiences running iCadenza, not by fault of anyone, just by my own relationship with myself, how I chose projects, how I created goals, and how I forced myself down a path where if I committed, it, I had to do it no matter how I felt about it. So a big part of my own journey and in stepping into my creative work and to starting my own business has been getting in touch with myself, my intuition, and trying to notice where is my energy and how do I move in alignment with where I have energy and move away from anything that feels like this horrible effort because I know what that's like. I've been there. So that's sort of the secret to it. It's taken time to find it, but the truth of the matter is I have so much energy for my work because I absolutely adore each and every one of the people that I work with. You know, there's not a single client who can pop up on my calendar where I feel anything but, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to talk to Chris or whoever it is. It's literally a highlight of my day to spend time with the people who are in my professional community. And I love the relationships that I've built. It's just such a huge gift to my life to call this what I do. So when putting on an event like that, it's a dynamic where actually in that case, I do have, I did have personal relationships with a lot of people who were there, close to half of the people who attended I've worked with or have known in some way. And that gave me a great feeling of this is not a crowd of strangers. There are some people who are new to me, but there's a lot of friendly faces there who are going to make me feel comfortable. And then I just thought a lot about how do I create a tiny ounce of that personal connection with everyone else who's going to be there who I don't know yet. So in my case, that looks like just because I'm perhaps a crazy person, sending handwritten notes and journals and chocolate to everyone to just be like, hi, I'm so happy you're coming. Yay. I have my handwritten note right here. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I love that. I love getting to sit down and write notes to the people who are so special to me and anyone who chooses to spend a cent and block off time in their calendar to spend time listening to what I have to say. That means the world to me. I take it so seriously and I just want to connect with that person. It's fun. I love it. And I, I just want to restate that and see if I can reframe what you just said in another way, just so we can make sure this point gets across because I think it's a huge takeaway. So how do you achieve ease in your life? And if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, it's about alignment. And if I could in indulge myself a metaphor, if you think about tuning an analog radio to a particular station, if you want to hear a jazz station, but you're tuning to talk radio, you can crank the volume as much as you want. You can listen as hard as you want. You can stomp around the room as much as you want. You're not going to hear what you want to hear because you're not aligned with what you want to hear. And once you get in alignment, you can turn the volume way down. It's a nice clear signal and everything just flows. That is a beautiful image for it. I love it. And, you know, if I may, this year I've canceled more projects than I ever have. I never previously would give myself permission to do that because I felt like if I've committed, I've committed. But this year I've given myself the opportunity to notice that thing that sounded awesome a month ago, it doesn't feel in alignment anymore and it's causing me stress. And to just say, I'm not going to do it 
has been huge. And I have to say, this is one of the reasons why I think coaching is so important because I couldn't have made those decisions on my own. I needed someone else to talk to, oftentimes my coach, for them to say, what if you just don't do it? I see what the pressure of that is doing to you. You don't have to do it. So that has been really essential to me in staying in alignment. I can't always find it on my own. Well, that, that's a perfect segue to my next question. What's the role of a coach? I had my first experience working with a life coach when I was in my early 20s, and I'm so grateful for it. And it, it came about in sort of a funny way. I was doing CrossFit at the time, which no longer do that, but it was, it was a thing that I did for a while, and it was great. And I happened to meet a life coach at the gym, and I had never heard of what that was. I, a lot of people have really negative conceptions of what life coaching is. I just had never heard of it. And... I was curious to have a conversation because I knew that she helped people accomplish their goals. And at that time, I felt like I need that so badly because I'm failing in every way. I'm horrible at accomplishing my goals and I need someone to show me the way. And I remember so clearly it was in that first conversation that someone that this coach pointed out to me, the fact that the running monologue in my head was not necessarily speaking the truth. I really thought that all of those nasty things that I was saying to myself were just reality and things that I needed to hear. And it was in this conversation that I learned that, no, you actually have some choice over the running monologue and you can either use it to help yourself be better or to hold yourself back. So that was just a hugely powerful realization and made me just like, I need this. I, I need someone to show me the way because all my life I've had this desire to fulfill whatever potential I have and never feel satisfied if I, if I feel like I'm falling short of that. So um, that put me on the path to working with a coach. Um, I've worked with so many over the years, uh, you know, for my business, for different aspects of my, you know, relationship with myself for my artistic work. And I just, I love being coached. I love having that person who I have hired to be there for me, you know, where like it gets to be all about me and I get to get attention. I get to have help and it doesn't feel like I'm taking up too much of their time or not being reciprocal enough. Like that is what you're paying for is to like, to let it be about you and your dreams. So if something matters to me now, I don't waste any time trying to do it alone. Um, I find the support and accountability to help me get there faster and more joyfully and with less pain. To me, that's what having a coach is all about. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this interview. I just wanna hop in here really quick and let you know if you are a musician who is ready to take the leap and bring your music and your skills and your knowledge to a whole new audience in a whole new way, my six-month group coaching program, The Online Business Accelerator, launches on February 15th, 2021. There are limited spots available, application only, but I'm inviting you, my listeners, to hop on a free 30-minute discovery call with me, no obligation, right now. Go to honestypill.com, check out the Online Business Accelerator page, and click on any of the buttons there to get to my schedule link. Okay, it sounds like the orchestra's done tuning. I gotta get out of here. Hope you enjoyed the rest of this episode. Let's talk about that running monologue for a moment. And let's talk about it being all about you. When I mm -hmm. first spoke to you about sales calls, I remember saying quite confidently, well, I'm going to have all these bullet points ready to go and how many modules and the cost and this, that, the other. And, I, and I'm, I'm ready. I feel like I'm ready for these sales calls. And I remember your reaction. You said, you know, I I don't think actually, let me let me preface it with this. Jennifer has what I call the coach face. And when she gives you the coach face, that means what you're saying straight up wrong. It's just wrong. And I know you wouldn't put it that way, but I'm putting it that way for you. I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lay out these bullet points. I'm going to talk about this, talk about that. There was this moment of silence. I got the coach face and Jennifer said, I think the way sales calls go is going to surprise you. And I had no idea what you were talking about. Then you introduced me to Nancy Klein. And Nancy Klein's 
sort of role, how she would define a coach, in my, my interpretation, is to foster your student or your client's best independent thinking. And that was the key that has literally unlocked not only my coaching practice, it's made me a better teacher, it's made me a better husband, a better father, a better friend. I feel like I understand what conversations are actually meant to be because I don't have a running monologue. Can you talk about, Nancy Klein, and what is the thinking environment? Absolutely. So I was introduced to Nancy Klein through my co-founder at iCadenza, Julia, who was introduced to it by the first coach we ever worked with, Carolyn Fryer Jones and Michelle Bauman, who are two wonderful coaches. Uh, Michelle passed away several years ago. Um, but anyways, Nancy Klein is an educator and a coach who wrote a book called Time to Think and another one called More Time to Think and perhaps others. But she sort of, through her research, pioneered this method. It, it is sort of a coaching methodology called the thinking environment or time to think. And it's really just about, it's kind of, you know, has some parallels perhaps to active listening, but it's really based on this premise that someone can do their best thinking in the presence of a particular kind of attention from another person. And that this is the ultimate gift that we can give to another person is to just provide the supportive attention that allows their thoughts to go in new directions and allows them to discover the solutions to the questions that they have. So it's so it's such a radical way of perceiving things because of course, as the teacher, as the coach, we also love to have all the smart answers and to say the brilliant thing that makes the person go, oh my God, I will listen to everything you say. You know, we like that. There's sort of an ego part of us that feels really good when we can do that. But it's even more magical to just be creating the space for someone to have a realization on their own that is as good, if not better, than what I would have come up for them. And it really is just a realization of how we don't, like making it about us of having to be perfect, having to say the right thing is putting our attention absolutely in the wrong place. And it's losing sight of what really matters in that context. So her work has been a huge influence for me, and I'm so, so happy that you and others have taken to it so seriously in adopting it, because I really believe it's, it's one great way that we can support the healing and growth of anyone that we encounter. One of the pieces of advice she gives in More Time to Think is, there is no piece of tech, new shoes, or fancy school that can provide your child with as much value as you quietly listening, completely focused on what they have to say. Uh, speaking of going in new directions, I'm gonna give us a little whiplash here, and I wanna talk about pricing for a minute. Let's get down to where the rubber meets the road. Results and pricing. Let's talk numbers for a minute. One of the first things you ever said to me about my idea for an audition course was, and I can't, again, I got the coach face here, I think the way you're going about that is good but it seems like a lot of work and for not a lot of money. And just to give context, I was planning on charging $147 for a multi-hour pre-recorded, self-directed audition strategy course that would have required me to spend hours and hours in a studio recording and editing videos. So here's my honesty pill moment. I have to be honest with you, Jennifer, it was really scary for me when you suggested that I charge a lot more than I was planning. And that's because you didn't see the price tag when you looked at my work. You saw the value. Can you talk about that? And is that sort of, can you unpack that reaction a little and maybe tell us how often do you see that kind of fear in your clients? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll speak to that. And the, the thing that I want to speak to first is I have been in the shoes of, you know, where you were of, I want to create something that encapsulates all my knowledge, that is affordable, accessible, that once I invest the time up front, it's passive and infinite numbers of people can benefit from what I've put together. You know, I, I, I have experienced and wanted to create things like that on my own. I, I created many digital products um, running iCadenza and it just put me in a state of what, what do I call it? Sort of the kind of like underpaid founder syndrome where you've put so much time and attention and love into this thing. And when it doesn't 
make money, you can start to feel resentful towards it and you can start to lose your motivation. Again, not that we're all so money motivated, but I believe that we do have this desire to feel compensated for the value that we offer and for the effort that we put in. Otherwise, why continue? So I don't, you know, I don't pretend that starting a business is zero work and zero effort. It takes effort. But what I'm, what I see as the thing that keeps me in the game and that keeps my clients motivated is getting compensated well as soon as possible. That's the number one thing that builds momentum. And the other thing, you know, I, a big part of my strategy is helping musicians move into price points that are often way higher than they ever would have thought was possible. In the business coaching world, we call this high ticket packages, basically. And the there's a lot of great reason. There's a lot of reasons why I think it's a great strategy. Certainly financially, it's it's nice to make more money, but I see such a shift in the level of fulfillment that is also possible if you work in this way, because rather than putting all your effort into a prepackaged thing and having zero contact contact with a person who uses it, which to me was deeply unsatisfying. Um, I want to know how people receive what I created. I want to help them with it. And not having that two-way thing made me feel kind of deflated. Whereas if we are, you know, what I see as the value of what you have to offer, Chris, is in addition to anything pre-recorded, it's you. It's the access to you. It's the learning from your knowledge and having it adapted in real time to my needs or to um, just be in in your energy and your vibe to like be inspired by that and to like let that impact me, you know, in all these different ways. That is worth so, so much. So I've helped many musicians who charged, you know, an hourly rate for a lesson anywhere from say $80 to a hundred something, $200 to going from that to just as an example, a six month, group package where they charge $5,000. And, you know, it, it kind of sounds absurd. Uh, you know, a lot of my clients don't believe that this is going to be possible, or at least they didn't before. But when you think about how much musicians have invested to get to the point of where they are and still feel like they don't have what they want and still feel so far away from it, the savings in money, in time, in agony to get there faster and to sort of be on this more exponential path of growth is worth so much. So I don't know if that answers your question, but those, that's some thinking on on that higher price points. Absolutely. And it reminds me of something I've learned and been reinforced with our work together is good coaching is about transformation, not information. So yes, the pre-recorded course that I had made was good, but it wasn't super impactful. In fact, I don't think I developed a single raving fan from that course, even though I did serve some people. So you said underpaid founder syndrome. So now I can add that to my list. Money mindset problems, imposter syndrome, underpaid founder syndrome. Awesome. Speaking of imposter syndrome, do you ever feel like a fraud? Do you ever, you know, does imposter syndrome still hit you? Oh, all the time, all the time. You know, I, I think I perhaps feel that less in my business, although, you know, I remember the first time I ran my program, the six figure musician entrepreneur, you know, I couldn't sleep the night before my first class because I had enrolled people into a thing that a process that I had done before for myself, but I hadn't really experienced teaching it to people in a systematic way. And I didn't know if I could do that or, you know, was everyone going to want their money back, all of that. So, so yeah, um, I have felt that in my business quite a lot, but just, uh, you know, it's like with anything else. I've been practicing. I've been doing it more at this point. So in 2020, collectively, my clients have earned well over $2 million this year, which means that I have played some supportive small role or larger role in, gosh, I don't know, 20 plus launches. So I've just gotten better at what I do because I've done a lot of it. But honestly, I think it's important for me to constantly be at the edge of being uncomfortable. And a lot of that is in my artistic world. So I'm writing a musical 
Um, I don't. Did I tell you this, Chris? I'm actually planning to do it as a podcast musical now. <laughs> I, first of all, I don't even know what that is. What's a podcast okay. musical? So they exist. There are a few podcast musicals where it's um, kind of like a mix between a cast album and a radio play where it's designed for that format. But, you know, we're still kind of in a pandemic. I have no idea when I could possibly get a stage production. So I'm looking at how can I turn this into something that is within my control to complete. So podcast, it may be. All right. You you guys heard the breaking news here. Uh, breaking for, news. Yes. Forthcoming podcast from Jennifer Rosenfeld with her musical. Um, if you want to sing a little bit now, we can do that. Whatever Whatever I can do to help you. Okay, we're not, not going to do that. Okay, but. thank God, thank you. Um, I have a couple more businessy questions, and we're gonna yeah. we have have something at the end for you here too. You have an incredible intuition about people. No two ways about it. Are there early indicators that someone may or may not be successful that you've identified that you see over and over again? So first of all, I will agree with you. I do have a great intuition about people, and part of it is, I think part of why I love this work is it's very creative for me. And I love getting to know someone and sort of feeling like the pieces come together around like, I know exactly how I would recommend this person position what they do. I'm starting to get ideas for how they can position their offer for it to be really different. That's part of why I love this work too, is it's a, it's a creative outlet for me to help people create their stuff. But um, as far as the qualities that tend to correlate with the kind of person that I want, I like to work with or who can be successful. It's usually a few things. One is, at least in my world, I love working with teachers. I just love, or any person who considers themselves dedicated to the art of helping other people grow, whether it's through knowledge, through some kind of coaching or therapeutic work. Um, I, I really, I think you need to have that passion for service to do this work because ultimately we're in the business of helping people improve their lives. And if that's not motivating to you, then you're not going to like this. So that's a big part of it. I love working with people who are willing to try new things and put themselves at the edge of what they think they can do. And in my case, it's really cool because I get to work with people like you, Chris, or you know, people who are at the top of their field, who have achieved success undeniably, and yet who have the humility and willingness to be a beginner in this new area and to mess it up sometimes and to fumble and to try something totally new. That is such a winning combination and it says so much to me versus someone who is very dedicated to that pristine image of like never wanting to show any cracks in the surface. That's a lot harder because I know what I ask people to do is deeply uncomfortable. So there's that. And I think I really appreciate working with people who take responsibility and who are constantly looking inward for how they can improve themselves and how they like might be getting in their own way. You know, like it's very common that I am dealing with a client and they're in a situation that's very challenging. And the more that they are able to be honest about the difficulty and share about that, I'm not looking for anyone to sugarcoat it or pretend that it's not happening, but the willingness to say this sucks and I want to, I want like, what do I do? How do I move through it? Rather than saying like, you know, you said this would work and it didn't. So, so that willingness to take responsibility, to understand that this road will be bumpy and to learn and grow from it, that's that's sort of what it takes. You've just given me another amazing segue because I was about to ask you for your honesty pill moment, which is you know thinking about how we have many experiences and opportunities that give us self-reflection and impact the course of our lives. And often the biggest impact comes from when we look at ourselves with complete, almost brutal honesty. Can you think of a moment in your life, and maybe you've already answered this question before with the lawyer thing, uh, where you had such a reflection and it resulted in an honesty pill moment for you that was a major pivot? I was working with a coach. This was in, I guess, 2016. I had gotten my MBA, JD MBA, and I felt like, oh, I should be good at what I do now. Um, but I didn't feel that way. And I worked with this fabulous coach and the task I gave her was, I want you to help me 
figure out how to win at being the CEO of iCadenza. That's all I wanted. And I remember in our first conversation, she said to me, so if you had no obligations, no, you know, no duties to, to, to anyone, no expectations, like what would you do? And I remember feeling angry that she asked me that because like what came up was I would write a musical. And I was angry because like I didn't hire her for that. And that's not what we were meant to talk about. But it was it was something that I like admitted and then kind of had to deal with. And that really put me on a journey to getting started. And for me, the a big part of my life for many years was sort of denying that I had an artistic side and instead feeling like it was enough for me to just bask in the artistic genius of all the people that I work with. And it, it, it wasn't enough. And it left me feeling really sad and really like, I'm on the outside of this thing that I really want to be a part of. So I think that's sort of my moment. And I have to say that I've shared this with you, with my clients, that the best decision I ever made for my business was deciding that I was going to write the musical and really taking it seriously because I finally owned something that really mattered to me. And I see that um, owning that I feel like allowed me to attract people who are looking to be in that level of integrity with themselves too. So that was probably my honesty pill moment. That's a good one. So I also worked with a coach who I met through your community. It might even be the same person who put me through a similar exercise. And what I discovered through her work was that I meant to run a brewery. That's what we decided. You know what? If I could flip a switch... I would love to run a brewery. All right. Speaking of this community you have put together, I hope you don't mind. But when my colleagues heard that I was going to be interviewing you for the podcast, they had many questions that they wanted me to ask. And I have to share those oh. now. They're rapid fire from your actual clients. And you can, you can, can your responses can be short or long. It doesn't matter. It's whatever you want. So here's the first question. You gift a lot of books to your clients and the people in your life. Uh, I have many of them sitting on my bookshelf right behind me. What is the book you have gifted the most and why? The book I've gifted the most, it would probably be one of the money books that I recommend, like Overcoming Under Earning or perhaps The Big Leap. Awesome. Okay. This one comes from someone who is in my first coaching cohort with you, but I think we all want to know the answer. What is the number one thing you wish you had known when you started your coaching career? That... Connecting with people in a deep way is the joy of being in business. Like that's everything. And that is, I remember when I had my first session with a coach, when she was going to teach us how to build our business, she said, all right, make a list of people, you know, and then reach out to them. And I was absolutely terrified. I felt like that's not what I want to sign up for. You know, I, I am like by nature, perhaps I've changed, but I'm introverted. And I, throughout my childhood and in, into my adult years, I'm like a very deeply shy person who is not comfortable connecting with others. And I have learned that it's actually wonderful and it's the best part of being in business. So if you can find the joy and the love of just spending time with awesome people, and, and associate that as this is what I do being in business, then you're in for a treat. Oh, that's excellent. All right, here's a silly one, and I'm not going to tell you who, who this one is from, but I think this is an important question, Jennifer. If you were a cheese, what type of cheese would you be? Ooh, okay. Um, I were a cheese. You know, I, I will try to keep this brief because I love a lot of different types of cheeses. Um, and it's, it's a different question from like, what is my favorite cheese or what, what would my ideal cheese plate be, which I, I could answer too. Um, but I have come to really appreciate the nuance of a great Alpine cheese, which where it's like a raw milk cheese with, um, it's like a little bit nutty and creamy and it's a little bit aged. So, um, yeah, one of those kinds of cheeses. That was that was a better answer than I could have ever hoped for. That was totally my question, by the way. I'll, I'll be honest about it. All right, I'm going to... Here's our last question. I'm going to turn one of your own questions around on you. If 2021 turns out to be the best year imaginable for Jennifer Rosenfeld, what would you like to see in your life that is deliberately different than today? Well, 
my my big dream for 2021 is to sort of like exist in the world more as an artist so i want that to be the year that i release things you know i've been talking about doing the work for a while but i kind of want to show what i have to offer and see what that where that takes me so that's sort of the big thing i'm very grateful that my business is set up in a way that i'm already enrolling clients for 2021 and structuring things so that i'll continue to have more time but but yeah that's sort of what i'm hoping for is is a little bit more chill on the business side and um, more music more writing more of that Jennifer, it goes without saying, but I want to go on record here now anyway, that I truly appreciate what you're doing in the world. It is the understatement of all time. Obviously, you've had a massive impact on the direction of my life and the lives of so many others. The work you're doing is changing the landscape of our industry. And I feel so lucky to have been in your orbit to soak up as much as I can. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's honestly, it's been so wonderful getting to work with you. You know, all of my clients, I seriously, I don't have one that I dislike. They're all amazing, but I just so appreciate our time together and what you've created over the last year. It's been so inspiring. Awesome. Well, I'd say goodbye, but I'm going to see you in a coaching session on Monday. So I'll see you after the weekend. Thank you so much for being here on the show and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Big thanks to my coach and mentor, Jennifer Rosenfeld. I'm sure I'll have to have her back on for a follow-up session next season. There's so much information that we could be talking about. And look, keep your ears open for Jennifer's musical coming soon to a podcast near you. I'm sure that's going to be amazing. And can I just point out, isn't it awesome and inspiring that someone who has had such an impact on the musician, entrepreneur, business development side of things is also taking time to create her own projects like the musical. That's called walking the walk right there. By the way, before I sign off today, I hope these interviews this season are starting to get you thinking about where you are in your career right now, what your performance schedule looks like, how your teaching methods or studio have changed, and what your bank account looks like. Whether you're sitting in a full-time orchestra job or you're a freelance musician or a music educator, there are so many opportunities available to you right now if you're willing to open your mind to possibility, if you can be honest with your limiting assumptions, and if you're willing to try something new. I don't think it's a secret that by now I'm spending the majority of my time at Honesty Pill talking to musicians about how they can turn skills developed in 10,000 hours in a practice room into wildly successful and fulfilling online businesses. If you have ideas, questions, or just want to talk about where you are in your musical life right now, you at least owe yourself a conversation. And if you already have an idea for a business, then I really want to talk to you. Shoot me an email at chris at honestypill.com and let's connect. All right, that's it for me today. This has been Honesty Pill podcast number 14. You can find out more at honestypill.com. Check out the free resource library. Lots of good stuff over there. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time.